on today's episode of the Brad and Will Show. We haven't got around to it yet, but it's a hot topic. We're going to be talking about Jalen Green's future with the Houston Rockets, along with Fred Van Fleet and Dylan Brooks's future with the Rockets. So you don't want to miss this one. We have a Houston Rockets sports journalist on the show with us to discuss. So stay tuned. All right, and welcome back to the episode of the Brighter and Will Show. I'm the first host, always Will. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, everybody is Houston. I'm going to shout out the Playback Room, Houston Live. Tap in with that for show. Um, and continue to support the podcast. We appreciate the love and support you've been showing us on that front. Pass it off to Brad. Yeah, you know where to find me, Brad NBA, Instagram, Twitter. Um, same old, same old. We're on Playback now, watching the games uh, live from stream. So if you're going to watch some Rockets games with us, definitely come through. But yeah, today's episode is going to be a fun one. We have our guy Michael on the show. Houston sports journalist, Houston journalist itself for the Cron. Uh, we're very happy to have him on. So, Michael, how are you doing today? Doing well. Thanks for having me on, fellas. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course, of course. Before we get started, is there anything that you want? We're going to have you plug it at the end again, but is there anything you want to like tell the listeners up front, you know, just about you and your content, where they can find you at? Yeah, for sure, guys. I appreciate that. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at mshap2. Uh, and more importantly, you can read all of my content, all Rockets content, Astros content for free at cron.com. So, make sure to go there. I'll be covering the Rockets through the season, through the off season, and into this future year. So it should be fun. There it goes. Yeah, yeah. So here we're gonna start with our guest first. Again, it's been a, it's been a hot topic. We haven't discussed it quite yet on this show. So yeah, Jalen Green, let's do it. Past two games have been good. Back to back thirty four uh, point outings. Uh, but the story of his season has been, you know, inconsistency. A lot of games shooting under forty percent. You maybe don't get benching him mid third quarter, and he doesn't play a lot of fourth quarters. Um, so overall, you know, it's been a, a huge topic, as I've mentioned, but what are your thoughts on that huge situation? And, you know, what do you think Jalen Green's future could be with the Rockets? you think there's a possibility that they trade him this offseason? You know, I would definitely still peg it as more likely that he will return in the Houston Rockets uniform. I think just because the situation of offloading him will be so complex, right? It's the year before a potential rookie extension, so I don't know how excited other teams would be to engage in those negotiations. Also, more importantly, we see Jalen's talent, right? I mean, it's pretty obvious. It was obvious in Phoenix. We see it in spurts. We saw it through the first two years. So I have a hard time seeing Rafael Stone totally punting, right, on Jalen's talent. Now, I think the bigger question is, through these next 22 games, what kind of player do we project Jalen Green to be in year four and year five, right? I think that 25-point-per-game all-star thing is kind of in the rearview mirror. That doesn't mean he has to be a negative player with this team, right? So I think exploring and understanding what he'll be through these next 22 games is, is pretty pivotal. It's one of the stories of the season left, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I'll, I'll go for this for this point. Yeah, Jalen, it's been frustrating for me. You know, um, if you look at his game, he's played every single game for the Houston Rockets. And I want to say he leads the NBA right now in games shooting 40% or lower. Even with that being said, I understand why a bunch of fran- uh, fans are frustrated with him. But to me, again, it is a complex situation, as Michael put it. You can't just trade them just to trade them. If they're going to trade them, they're going to try to get a star, in my personal opinion. And I don't know what star is necessarily going to be available. You know, they want Macau Bridges, but Brooklyn's not getting rid of Macau Bridges. So I, I kind of agree with Michael on this one. I don't think they're just going to off put him for no reason. And I don't know what star is necessarily going to be available for them to get if they were going to, you know, move a Jalen Green. And one thing I just kind of want to add. More so, it's, it's ported. No, you got it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, Just one thing I wanted to add here is, you know, you've seen Ime Udoka bench Jalen, show frustration with Jalen. He's never shown that he wants to give up on Jalen or tether him to the bench, right? I think there are still kind of moments of confidence where Ime is trying to instill. We still see a really talented player. Last year on Saturday night in Phoenix, he said he's making the right reads. He's progressing. So the infrastructure, I don't think, is like out on Jalen Green or anything like that. I think that kind of narrative has been a little overblown of late. Yeah, and I do like that Udoka hasn't given up on him. You know, they ask him, hey, are we going to move him to the bench? You know, he keeps him in that starting lineup to keep that confidence up, you know. And if he's not performing, again, he'll just – he just won't play him down the stretch. But, you know, I do like, you know, in these past few games, they've been playing at a faster speed. He had 14 fast break points in that last game, which was a season high. That fits his style of play. And we've heard there were, you know, potential frustrations about, you know, how he viewed the Rockets and their play style. So them playing faster, you know, works well for him. So my thing is I was going to finish with – I'm interested to see how they play 
to Jalen's strengths or if he can fit in with the team's strengths. You know, um, I've seen at times where they cater to him at the beginning of the game. They want to get him going and it throws off the flow of um, what the Rockets are ultimately trying to do. So I just want to see how he fits in with the Rockets going forward and if this is able to jump perfectly because we'll say it a million times. I, I think this young court does fit well together. Their talents do. They just have to make it work. But yeah. Um, I guess it's my turn. Where I fall on um, on the, the Jalen Green situation, for me, um, I've, I've been someone who's pushed back on the idea. Like, I didn't think that at the, at the trade deadline. Um, I thought that was – like one, you're probably especially with how with how he's played this season. I don't think that you're going to get you're going to have to attach something not to dump him, but to like to get a real upgrade. I don't think whereas you know a year ago you probably trade Jalen Green one for one for uh, a really talented player. I think this year they're going to want a little bit more on top of that. So I don't think his value was necessarily there where you would really see any real return on trading Jalen Green. And you have to ask yourself the question of is what you're about to trade Jalen Green for, which we all agree is probably not going to be – like you're not trading Jalen Green for Donovan Mitchell straight up. You're not trading Jalen Green. Um, you know, Mikael Bridges was the hot name. Brooklyn's not trading you Mikael Bridges just for Jalen Green. Like you're going to – you know, the best player you probably trade Jalen Green for, you know, best case scenario might be like a low-tier starter, right? Just one for one. I guess probably, the, you know, best case scenario. So is a low-tier starter, whatever he's going to give you, is that worth – punting on whatever percent chance you think Jalen Green actualizes his potential. And for me, it was like, nah, I'd rather, I'd rather just take the L on it and bank on Jalen Green becoming Jalen Green as opposed to trading him. And then, you know, like what happens if he figures it out? You know what I'm saying? Because the person, what we're about to trade him for probably wouldn't even be worth that much in my opinion anyway. So um, that's where I'm at. Now, uh, that was the trade deadline. Where I'm at right now um, is I am okay with not trading Jalen Green. Um, I do think that if you're someone who wants there to be significant roster turnover, somebody has to go. Um, you know, you can't – you have five guys from your young core. Well, six guys, actually, I'm tripping. You have six guys from your young core, if you include Jalen. And then you have Fred and Dylan Brooks, who we're going to get into next. That's eight guys. You have, and also Steven Adams, right? He, he's here. He just showed up to practice um, today, I believe, was his first day with the team. Um, so that's that's nine guys. That's an NBA rotation. So you can't, you know what I'm saying? If you wanted some a roster turnover, some new guys in the in the in the room, somebody has to go, right? So that that's first and foremost. Um, but I'm okay if you if you if you're okay with saying you feel like we got we're good with where we at. Like I can say that argument. I'm okay with not trading Jalen Green. I don't I don't I think that there's a there's a real scenario where he, um, for as, as disappointing as he's been this season, that he could go into this off season, you know, another season with Udoka and come out next year and start seeing some of that potential. I think that's absolutely uh, uh, in the realm of possibility. For me, though, you cannot go into next season with Jalen Green as your starting shooting guard if you're trying to win. You get, Unless unless he goes out and he earns it this year. I'm not saying he didn't necessarily earn it this year, but to be fair, he didn't have competition, right? Like, it was it was Jalen Green. I mean, you wasn't going to start Cam Whitmore at the two. You wasn't going to start Reggie Bullock. You wasn't going to start a men. So it was kind of like he had no real competition to take that spot from him. He needs to have competition this summer, which, you know, could be a Men Thompson. It could be Cam Whitmore. It could be somebody you trade for. But he, he can't go. We cannot go into next season with him uncontested because as much as we love the guy, as much as we believe in him, he has been one of, if not the biggest reason this team is not taking the next step. Right. If you look at the advanced numbers, if you look at, uh, you know, the on court play, all that good stuff, a lot of that back backs the idea that like Jalen might be kind of holding the team back to a degree right now. If you were to replace Jalen Green with, uh, a normal starting level guard. How many more wins do we have this season? You know, that's a that's a that's a real question. So I think that even if you want to keep Jalen, he has to earn that starting spot. He should no longer be shoe shoehorned in for the starting shooting guard spot. And I think that they should eat, like I say, whether they trade for someone to give him competition or whether that's you know whether Cam or Men step up and that's the competition. But he cannot go uncontested into next season as the starting shooting guard of this team. And we 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 think we're gonna win. Like I, I don't think you can do both. I thought one interesting thing you guys did bring up, and it's a pretty intriguing point, is that Jalen, on the surface, or at least in theory, should be a perfect player to kind of complement the rest of the starting five, right? I mean, this Rockets offense is dying for a two-guard, a wing player that can create yep. one shot and score, right? You have some minus or middling shooters. The Fred and Alper and pick-and-roll is getting a little clogged. So you need someone who can create his own gravity. When Jalen's right, as we saw in Phoenix, boom, the offense kind of lights up, right? But these extended struggles, the lack of growth, 
it's hamstringing the offense. I mean, they're number 25 in offensive rating since January 1st, right? They're number 28 in three-point percentage. So that's the tough thing is, like, in theory, if Jalen was the player which they wanted him to be, boom, you'd have perfect starting five. But it's a long uphill climb to that as we as we see. Yeah, and that's, that's a great point. Um, Jalen Green, as you, as you mentioned, pick and roll game with LP and Fred is the main focal point. And, again, they go to that all time and time again. Jalen Green is right there to hit those threes. He's just been – we haven't even spoke about this. His, um, I, I want to mention this. I, I don't know what happens to his three-point shot um, from his past two years to now. He was never at an elite level, but he has seen a, a sharp decline out of nowhere. Again, good last two games, but uh, the sample I, I got um, from his past two seasons to now, he, he dropped around 12% on wide-open three-point attempts um, for, for no reason. He went from 39%. To a, I have to look now, I'll but look as of two games, quick. yeah, it was 26%, uh, 26.6% last I looked. So, again, I, I don't necessarily think that's um, just, oh, he wasn't working on his game. It's just, and I'll ask you this, Michael. You think that's mental or rhythm? Um, I don't know. I couldn't find a way to, to figure out how he's just missing open threes all of a sudden. But, again, when those shots are falling, He's perfect for this Rockets offense. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a strange thing. He's twenty seven point five percent since January first from three. You know that's that's pretty brutal. I think early in the season you were seeing him hitch on a lot of shots, take that extra beat, look uncomfortable. He's looking a little more uncomfortable and a little more aggressive. Perhaps you could say this is just a variance thing over two thirds of a season. Maybe he's forcing it. I really don't know the culprit, but I do agree the extended shooting slump where it was him. Jabari Smith and Dylan Brooks shooting cool. like 26% from three for like two weeks. It, it really sunk the season, right? So I don't have a perfect explanation, but the three-point shooting from the team and the lack of spacing writ large, it's really sunk this offense, which is pretty brutal. I, I don't I don't know if y'all saw my uh, my facial reaction, but I looked up <laughs> the number. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so on catch and shoot threes this season, he's shooting 30.2%. Um, wow. But the the number that made me gasp like that was on threes that are classified as wide open on NBA.com. He's a six plus feet, uh, the closest defender. So like, pretty much there's no one near him. He's shooting a twenty eight point nine percent clip from three, which is just absurd to me, bro. Um, yeah, that's that's crazy to me. Um, and you know, I I thought that he would shoot a higher clip on yeah. um, on threes that are like tight and very tight, but he actually doesn't. So. Yeah, I will say it was 26.6% of the last time. So it's, it's going up a little bit, you know, it's, it's improving. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. Like for me, it's just like, because that's one thing too. I'm hearing people say like he's not being used properly and he's, you know, he's out of position, out of place. And my, my thing with that is like, how do you use a player of that profile, right? Who is shooting 30% or less on catch and shoot threes on threes that are considered wide open. Like that's, that's a shooting guard. How do you do that? Um, he doesn't have the world's tightest handle. Like I don't, I don't, I don't know if there's, if there's a stat to track this. Uh, maybe right, you can tell me if there is. But I'm willing to bet he might be. If he's not the highest, he might be top five in getting stripped, losing the ball on the way to the rim. Like I, I've never seen a player who drives more and just gets stripped every single. And, and to be fair, uh, sometimes he is getting fouled. Like, I, I will give him credit for that. Like I do, I do think Jalen Green gets a pretty bad whistle. But like he gets stripped pretty, so he's not someone who you can consistently rely upon to get to the basket. And then even if he does get there, he's not the best at finishing through or around contact. So, you know, and then I see people saying like he should run point guard, but I'm like, nah, that's that's not like that's not who he is. You know what I'm saying? So I don't. I, I guess my question is, is just like what? How would you like? How is he being used in practice? I feel like the way he's being used right now is kind of what he was supposed to do. He's supposed to be able to um, knock down threes, attack closeouts gets to the rim and that's what they're trying to use him as and he's just not doing it right now you know so i don't know yeah i mean i, I don't think it's a, a misallocation of his skill yeah. or anything how he's being used by by Ime Udoka. i think it's just a lot of things where um in terms of driving at the rim it's a lot of throwing yourself into bodies although in phoenix we saw him make some nice dump off passes to a man hitting the guy in the corner so there is small growth there but no i think the way in which they deploy jalen is try to have him score and burst have him get downhill half court pick and roll situations, have him run. That's kind of how he should play. You make a good point about getting stripped in traffic. And that's a big difference already between him and Cam Whitmore. And someone else pointed this out. Apologies if it was one of y'all on Twitter, but you see Cam go to the rim. There's the strong two hands on the yeah. ball, right? He's ripping it through there and going up with Jalen. It's a little looser, right? So it's small things like that where 
if his game was more refined as a three point shooter going to the rim, if he was seeing the floor a tick better, we'd see a lot better of a player. And I think I, that may be some of the reason for optimism, right? We see the outline of a quality player. It's just not totally clicking, right? So now you might say it's late in year three. I'm tired of it, right? But <laughs> <laughs> right. But given the situation, I think it's just something where they're just going to have to keep plugging away and hoping we find a better version of Jalen as he gets older. To, to add to that, I'll let you go, right? Just to, to piggyback off one thing uh, Michael said, I think that um, – the one it, it could eat, like you said, it could either be encouraging or it can be discouraging, no matter what, how you want to look at it. But he has, to Jalen Green's credit, he has improved at everything else, right? His, you know, and he, maybe he said that's a lot of that is because now is the first time where he's been asked to. But just in the vacuum, his defense is better. It's not, it's not great, but it's, it's better, right? His playmaking, I've, I've seen Jalen Green make some really nice skip passes. He's made some really nice passes off the dribble. Um, out of like, you know, he goes to attack the rim and he's, he's made a, a good uh, good pass. He talked about the dump off pass. It's like a men. Um, I think him and Shingoon, they don't run it as much as I think they should, but I think that he's capable of, you know, hitting that quick little, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very telegraph pass. I'll, I'll give you that. But he's able to make that telegraph pass to Shingoon uh, rolling to the rim. So I, I've seen Jay Lingren kind of take some steps in the playmaking department. I think the area where he's really like improved it, and I don't know if there's, uh, you know, what the, what the percent is, but like, I've seen Jalen Green use his athleticism more to grab rebounds this year. Like I feel like that's one thing that he has made an emphasis of is like, you know, I may not be able to do too much, but I'm gonna go out there. I'm a I'm a crash for these boards. I'm a, you know, he's averaging um over that over that um the two game sample, I think he's averaging like seven rebounds per game, something like that. So he's he's been getting, he's been grabbing rebounds. He's he has a very, I wouldn't say he's a very complete game, but he has like the shell of a complete game. The problem is, is the one thing that we thought he was going to be good at, which is scoring, he can't do right for some reason. So, like, whether that's, you know, encouraging or discouraging for you, I think for me it's a little bit more encouraging because it's like the one thing that – the things I was concerned about with Jalen Green with was the other stuff, the ancillary stuff. I kind of figured that he would for sure be a lot to score, like, 25, 27 points in his sleep. So he's done a little bit of the opposite. So I guess for me it's like if we can ever get him to – and a lot of it, like, to be fair, a lot of it also is – he just can't make threes like a lot of uh, if he made threes, that would open up so much more of his game. Um, so like if he ever if he's ever able to like figure that out, which like I said, maybe it's an easy fix, maybe you don't. Um, I think that like I, said, I think there's a really good player there. But to to the credit of the conversation, it is year three. Um, and he is holding the team back while he figures this stuff out. So, you know, there's an argument to be made that like maybe he can't figure it out, but maybe he just won't be here. You know, maybe you need to start making the moves to say, you know, we got Shingun, we got, you know, and man, we got Cam, we got these guys that are ready. You know what I'm saying? They're ready to go right now. Um, and we have this one guy's kind of holding us back. So maybe it's, you know, better for the greater good if he goes somewhere else and we go somewhere else, you know? So I don't know. There's something to think about um, in the Jet the Green conversation. Yeah. I did forget what I was going to say, but I'll, I'll add on to what you were saying, Will. You know, if that three ball does come in, Jalen Green has a very quick first step. I saw it in that Phoenix game. He had some line drives past players who were playing up on him because he was hitting shots second game in a row. So once that three ball comes in and those defenders are air, you know, airtight on him, that quick first step is gonna is gonna be able to open up his game, as you mentioned. But that's the last thing I'll say on the Jalen topic. Always rooting for him. Um, I hope he does well, and I hope he does, you know, stay at Houston Rocket. But we'll see what happens. So now we're gonna talk about Fred Van Fleet, Dylan Brooks. They both had good starts, in my personal opinion, in um, in the start of the season. You know, up until December. You know, you look at the numbers; they look, they did really well. I haven't pulled up. We can start with Dylan Brooks, who in Memphis was, you know, everyone thought it was a bad hire because the efficiency was, it was awful. But he, he increased everything, you know, in the, uh, up until December, until the new year. He, he had a 59.4 true shooting percentage, was shooting 41% from three, you know, which was way up for, from last season in Memphis. And now you look at Dylan Brooks in 2024, his true shoe and his three point percentage um, is down to 36.4, which isn't the worst. Wait, I'm, still I'm sorry, over what? Over what time span is this? This is from 2024, 2024. He's so, a 52 true shooting? Um, Yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah, Jesus. yeah, yeah. And his field goal percentage is 39.2. The way Michael was pulling up those stats from 2024, I feel like you might have had those on you. So if you did, I didn't say yes. <laughs> <laughs> My fault. But, but yeah, so Dylan Brooks, he's falling back into – the Memphis Dylan Brooks and the defense, in my personal opinion, which was really good to start the season, has is kind of regressed. Um, and I look, this is the guy that we signed for twenty million a year for four years, and I liked what we were getting from him. I did. I liked that Eme had changed his shot profile. 
Me and Will talk about it all the time on stream. Dylan Brooks. It, it was working early in the year, Michael. You could tell me if I'm lying or not. They were posting up Dylan Brooks at the start of the year for mismatch purposes, and it was working. I like that shot for Dylan Brooks. It was a good shot um, at the time. It was 87th percentile, if you want to look on Synergy at a certain time. But now they are posting up Dylan Brooks, and he's fading away from the basket. He's not necessarily creating an advantage. And I don't even think that he's got a mismatch on him when he's posting up at this point in time. And then we're also seeing a bunch of bad shots from three. So it's it's been ugly. And there's been stints where I like the men in his spot personally. So, yeah, people have been bringing up should the Rockets trade Dylan Brooks this offseason. And we'll start with Dylan. Michael, what do you think um, about Dylan right now? Yeah, I mean, I think that situation, I think, is going to be a little more troublesome for the Rockets than the Fred thing just by the sheer nature of the contract. I think mean, three years for a player who we feel like after this year, who is probably already at his physical peak, if not a bit on the decline, is a little worrisome. I think the defense is more solid than all defense level right now, both on the ball and off the ball. And, you know, I'm not trying to pick on Dylan Brooks, but those, as you mentioned, those one-legged, like, elbow fadeaways are, are – they're, they're just driving me nuts, to be frank. You know, like, they're total offense killers – um, I think he's kind of in a searching mode, um, especially when you're not hitting from three, he's trying to get a little closer to the basket. And so um, I understand where he's coming from, but his offensive contribution right now where he can't hit from three, he's absorbing bad shots with that is really having a big, big issue for the Rockets right now. And, you know, you look already, I think Amen's a better defender, right? And I'm not saying that you should, you know, replace Dylan Brooks in the starting lineup. I think basketball has a lot more kind of, chemistry elements and internal elements yeah. where you can just change the lineup right away but looking towards 2025 2026 if he's still here in 27 how active is he going to be on the next rockets playoff team i'm a little skeptical of that to be completely honest that's a great point will what are your thoughts um <laughs> i didn't realize the numbers were this bad <laughs> the um the i mean it matches the eye test i i he has um regressed well i said no i didn't, it didn't i didn't think it was this bad but but yeah i, I knew his numbers had took a decline um recently than it was a target he was came out guns blazing um in the season. um like i i thought that he was without question the third best player on our roster behind uh Shingun and fred you know for mm -hmm. the first you know, half of the season mm -hmm. um and then you know rather recently my worst fears have kind of been confirmed with Dylan Brooks. Like that was the, cause I was like, I didn't want nothing to do with Dylan Brooks this summer. I thought that um, we should have went other directions um, with, with that money. Um, and then I, when I saw the contract, I was even more like, what the heck? So, um, but the main reason why I was kind of like, just chill on Dylan Brooks was like, I've seen what happens when he gets into those modes where it starts being Dylan versus the other team and he can shoot you out of a game, right? He can kind of like the, the IQ and the shot selection, like that can take you out of a game completely. And, you know, to his credit, he did a really good job of keeping that in check for like the first half of the season. But like, it, I don't know, I think it was like around the same time that Fred got hurt. He just like completely reverted back to um, that, that, um, that Memphis Olympics where he's taking shots that aren't within the flow of the offense. They're off balance. They're low, low quality shots. He's forcing it at times. Um, the defense has like completely like I, the shot selection is one thing I that that's that is what it is. But like the defense, I, I'm I'm very shocked at how um, how much his defense has regressed. Like I think Amin Thompson, I think you're right, Mike. I think he's the best defender on this team, um, and it's not particularly close at this point in time. Um, which if you would have asked me that question two months ago, I probably would have debated it for a little bit. But like now, it's like no, nah, it's just easily a men for me. Um, so. I don't know why um, or what's caused this, like, all of a sudden regression from Dylan Brooks. Uh, in terms of, like, his long-term outlook on the team, I'm not saying – I said this a couple of times. I'm not necessarily saying you have to move Dylan Brooks. I, I don't think you have to. I think you can keep him because, because you know, if you look at you look at seasons in totality. In the totality of the season, he's still been a positive. He's been worth the money we've given him. I think he's amazing for our locker room, amazing for our culture trying to build. Um, so, like, in totality, I don't think that he's been a problem where it's like, okay, you should be looking to move off of him. I, th I think he's been more good than bad in the grand scheme of things. Now, that being said, um, like I said, some if you want some change this summer, somebody has to go. You can't, you can't, you know what I'm saying? You can't keep the whole core together and you want change, right? Um, there's not there's not enough, you know, minutes for that. Um, 
And so I am not saying that I would move Dylan Brooks, but I would, he's not untouchable to me. I, if, if the right deal is there and I can, I could trade him and maybe feel that the, the minutes that he's taking the role he's taking with someone who makes more sense for what this team needs, I would do it. You know, I, I, I'm not saying that I, he's not a guy at all who I'm like, you have to keep it all costs. Like I, I think he's someone who I would lean more towards keep just cause I don't think you're going to get a better player than Dylan Brooks or like a better situation than what you have with Dylan Brooks. But he's not untouchable to me. Um, he's definitely somebody who, for the right price and for the right price, you could have him, um, in my personal opinion. Yeah, and one thing with with Fred and Dylan, not to totally spin us ahead, although we can, is both of those contracts are kind of at least – you can see how they could be value structured for Rafael Stone, right? I think with um, Dylan, it's $20 million of his average annual value. That's something that is not – so big where no team will absorb it, but it's also yeah. big enough where you could then use it as an anchor of a salary, right? If you want to attach a bunch of picks plus Dylan, theoretically. Yeah. With Fred, you know, I'll be completely honest. I at first thought it was three years, all three years guaranteed. Although it seems like a little more, right? Figured out that it is two years with the option. And guess what? That makes Fred a massive expiry next year. Not saying that he doesn't have value because I think that. I think we'll see a little bit better version of Fred down the stretch. I think he's still kind of recovering from the abductor thing, but regardless, um, that being a big expiry next year also makes it beautiful. So it's not like the Rockets, and this is a thing I've seen fans worry about. It. It's not like they're so boxed in where they're unable to make moves. They have both movable salaries, young players, and a lot of Brooklyn picks, right? So I personally don't think that any of these guys we discussed will actually be moved this offseason or by February, but they also can very much be moved by next offseason or February, which is important. Yeah, Yeah. and I was going to say on the Dylan front, I personally didn't have anything to add. I want to say with Dylan Brooks, yeah, he's been awful, you know, to start this this new year, 2024. I want to see how he looks, you know, going into next season because that will give me a better idea how he's going to look in the future. Um, And then you can make a move, you know, based off of that. But, yeah. And you're good. You you were not stepping us ahead. I was about to jump us to Fred Van Fleet right now. And I also wanted to start with you on the Fred Van Fleet front. Um, yeah, he's really good start to the year. Had a bunch of 10 assist games. Had more 10 assist games um, by before 2023 ended than he had in his entire career in Toronto, you know, for a single season. Like, that's how good he was. You know, that pick and roll with Al P was money. You know, that was the best connection in the NBA, statistically. Um, so now – yeah, it's falling off a little bit. Turnovers are starting to get up there a little more since his injury. But, you know, as a whole, since 2024, he's still only averaging 1.7, but the assist numbers are down and the efficiency is slightly down from three. But, Michael, you, you brought up a good point with Fred Van Fleet. Um, huge expiring deal. You know, do I think the Rockets move him before that? I don't think he may have would want to do that. But, you know, what, what do you think about, you know, I guess his future with the team, how he's been playing, you know, to start this Yeah, year? I think that – the current offensive sag isn't totally Fred's fault for a few reasons. I think the main one, as we kind of referenced earlier, is that lack of spacing and then a lack of a dominant second creator or even first creator, right? I think Fred at his best is a guy who's a fantastic steward of the offense, hits that pocket pass, makes the swing pass, great assist to turnover ratio. And then there's a guy who has some real burst in his real engine. When Fred is the guy who has to provide all the burst in the engine, not to disrespect him, He's just not going to do it with his size, his lack of speed, his age, et cetera, right? So I think as he's trying to carry so much of the load, it's just being exposed a little bit, right? I think that's kind of what we saw last year in Toronto, and that Toronto team had more talent than than this current Houston team, I think, offensively. We can debate that, I guess. So I think we'll see a better version of Fred. I think that Fred's performance next year is kind of dependent a lot on how Jalen plus Cam play, right? Like if Cam Whitmore has a big breakout or Jalen kind of course corrects, I think we'll see a little less fervor about Fred going like 12 and nine than we do now when we're frustrated seeing that, right? So is Fred a limited player? Like, yes, but you know, you can't blame him for the whole roster construction, I guess. So yeah, I, I guess if he was a little older, a little faster, it'd be better, but I still like him as a steward of the offense and I don't really see them moving on unless some crazy blockbuster scenario emerges, which I don't think any of us really see, right? So. I'll speak on this and then kick it to Will. Yeah, when it comes to Fred, I agree. You know, his he, he's been taking on a, a huge load offensively. You know, re, top ten, I want to say, in minutes per game, and he's got the ball. You know, most of the time when he's uh, when he's in there. So w- what I would do, you know, with Fred Van Fleet going into next season, I don't know if we'll necessarily see a change right now, but I'd like to see him be off ball a lot more. He is a really good catch and shoot three point guy, and the Rockets just happened to drop a point guard who's really good at getting to the paint and kicking it out to people 
and he's a good facilitator. I'd like to see Amin Thompson be on ball more. I think that would help Fred a lot. Um, and that would bode for a lot of the troubles that we've been seeing with Fred. So, yeah, again, Rockets need to push the pace more. Um, it is good that he's a really good stabilizer. Um, Fred, Fred obviously is a really good piece to have on a basketball team, but he, sh he, ne he shouldn't necessarily be the entire engine. And that's kind of what we've been seeing from him. So, yeah, that would be my um, – I would switch to that going into next year, like a heavy – like, yeah, Amin is the guy on the ball. <laughs> We're going to use Fred as kind of the guy who can be a secondary creator or catch and shoot three-point player because he's 43.5% last I looked in the past. It, it could have changed. Um, and I'd like to see him used a lot more like that. Doka said he wants 40-plus threes a night. Fred's a good guy to get some catch and shoot opportunities as opposed to pull-ups in traffic, which I don't necessarily like from Fred. <laughs> That's what I would say on that. What, what do you think, Will? Um, I looked it up. He is – Sixth in minutes per game this season, which I, yeah. I thought he'd be a little higher than that. Um, I wonder what is the number 37 ish? What is it? Um, the number is yeah, 36.8. Um, and then I'm looking up catch and shoot, yeah, catch and shoot, he's shooting 43 percent from three, and then on um, threes that are classified as wide open, he's shooting 41.5 percent. So he's a good shooter, yeah. Um, right. yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess for me, Fred is probably something like. People know how I feel about Fred. I don't think that um, – I don't think you move him this summer. I think that um, what he provides to this team is worth more than whatever you, you potentially trade him for, um, unless it's, like, of course, in, like, highly aggregation in, like, a, a large trade. But, like, even that, I, think, I think Dylan Brooks is probably more suited for that than Fred. Like, I don't I – don't, I think Fred's going to be the starting point guard of this team next season. That, that's fine. Um, I think a lot of the shortcomings with Fred get – exaggerated because he was he's being asked to be the best guard on the roster and that's not what he was supposed to do right he was supposed to be the second best guard behind Jalen Green the whole point I think one of the main reasons why you do sign a a Fred Lee instead of a James Harden besides the defensive purposes is because you wanted to put the onus on your young guys your James Harden could take a team even even at what he's what 35 now 34 35 even at this age James Harden can take a group of role players and get them the 10th seat, get them the, you know, the ninth seat, something like that. So if you want to really like put the, the onus on your young guys and see what they're made of, like that was what Fred Lee was supposed to do. So like two is great. Like Shingun done his part of the bargain. It's just been more like Jalen hasn't necessarily kept up his side of it. So that's why it looks like Fred has to do more, which he's not good at. Um, and like two, Fred's credit as well. Like I just feel like people say like he, he ball hogs and he holds people back. Like I've seen Fred, like he, I think in his ideal world, he is off ball way more than he is right now. I, I've seen him try to get off ball and try to get other play, other players going. You'll notice that like the shot selection and the the dumbing of the ball only occurs when it's like, all right, we're down, and you have an off game, you have an off game. Somebody has to step up. I guess it's me. You know what I'm saying? Like that, that's that's when I see Fred kind of start dumbing the ball. So, um, yeah, like I, I I think that his future for the most part is safe uh, going into next season. Now beyond that. Um, I am not accepting that team option at all. Like, uh, I, I'm, I'm okay with with restructuring it and, and resigning him long term for cheaper. But I am like, there is zero percent chance that that team option gets accepted for me. That that was he's he's here for two years on that contract, and we we can move on from there. Yeah, and well, you you make a great point. There's been games where the entire young core is clicking. He gets on Fred's running around. Fred's running around just moving the rock. And he's like, hey, y'all got it, man. Y'all y'all show me what y'all can do. You know that. That is his ideal world. And when the Rockets are losing, which has been often lately, you know, he does get into that that side of things where he's like, yeah, all right, let me take over. Let me start taking these pull-up threes, you know. So, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see. When guys start to step up, I think Fred will look a lot better. So I hold on to him um, for the entire season, obviously. Uh, that's referring to next year. And then that team option, I want to see. I'm not just going to say decline it right now. Obviously, that would probably be the best bet. But uh, I, I want to see what team is at. I can see Ime Udoka wanting to hang on to him. So obviously he loves he loves the guy you know perfect guy you know coach extension onto the court you know we'll see where the roster's at they have some moves to make this offseason potentially you know they have 37 ish million to, to work with if they want to go try to get somebody it's a lot that can change but yeah you know we'll see what happens with Fred uh, last thing we'll add um will and I don't even have to speak on this topic I'll just ask you Michael you think you have any predictions you know for the offseason you know they have a lot of salary with the Jock Landale you know, Jeff Green, Jay Sean Tate, who is out of the rotation now, obviously, because they want to shoot 43s a night, and that's not his game. And then also a Stephen Adams contract, who they could throw in, potentially. Yeah. But 
You do get to do something with that salary? Yeah, I mean, I think the three big guys that we hit on, Dylan, Fred, Jalen, I'd be surprised if they got moved. That kind of other aggregatable salary, I guess, is the best way to refer to those guys, not to insult them or anything. I could see them turning that around to, you know, some kind of $20 million per year shooter, a movement shooter. That would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this isn't a guy that's available, but like a Norman Powell type offensive spark kind of player, I think would be great. Also, that you might have two lottery picks. They might have one lottery pick. I think they might think about packaging this one. Last summer didn't make any sense. Obviously, they got steals in the draft, which was fantastic for the Rockets. Um, we will see a move. I don't think it involves the core core pieces, I guess is the best way I phrase that. I agree with you 100%. And I personally have nothing else to add. Will, do you have anything? All right. So, Michael, was this your first podcast? Uh, it was first appearing on y'all's show. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, hey, you did a great job. And again, tell the listeners, you know, where they can find you again. Yeah, for sure, guys. You can follow me on Twitter at mshap2, S-H-A-P-2. You can catch all my work on cron.com, Rockets, some Astros season getting started too. But these next 22 games, off offseason, um, I'll be your go-to guy. Get all the content for free. So, yeah, follow me on Twitter. Catch us on cron.com. And I really do appreciate you having me on, fellas. It's been nice. Yeah, yeah, I'll say this. You guys need to follow him on Twitter. I love, you know, his content. He drops really good articles with a lot of great information. I'll be good to quote tweet any of them so you can check them out if, if you don't see it. But yeah, definitely give Michael a follow. And I want to appreciate you for coming on the show. We'll definitely be having you back on. I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, so I'll echo that as well. We appreciate you taking time out today to come on our show. Um, I think we had a good conversation. A lot of good topics were discussed here. So uh, y'all yeah, make sure y'all tap in with him and his content. Um, we're definitely going to you know, plug all the socials in the, the description and uh, you know when this goes live on Twitter. So make sure y'all tap in with that. Um, and with that, I think we're good, right, Brad? That's, that's everything. We're all good. Appreciate, uh, appreciate y'all for tuning in, and we'll be back soon. All right, man. See y'all next time.